This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hi there. Welcome or welcome back to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist, and I've been practicing in Fayetteville, Arkansas for quite a while. I started Self Work about, gosh, almost five years ago now. We'll have a big celebration when we hit five years, that's for sure. But I started it because I wanted to extend the walls of my practice to a lot of people, obviously to those of you who might already be interested in psychological issues, maybe you're in therapy, to those of you who've just been diagnosed with something, or you're really looking for answers for whatever reason. Maybe you have a relationship problem that's just stubborn and you don't know what to do about it. But there's also a third group, to those of you who really don't know what therapy is. You might even say, I would never darken the door of a therapist. They're weird. (laughs) But I want to reach out to you because I think therapy and mental health treatment is actually very approachable and very doable. And so if you're curious enough or, sadly, unhappy enough to listen, I'm more than glad to have you here at Self Work. So welcome to all of you. I've been actually regaining a meditation routine, which is something I'm quite happy about. It. I did it while I was writing the book, and then I let it slip. And I saw this morning that they offered a meditation for the Sunday Scaries. That's on Headspace, if y'all are interested. The phenomenon that so many experience at the end of the week, or perhaps more importantly, the end of the weekend, and the dreaded anticipation of entering the following work week. It's been around a long time, and it's very real, although it's a little difficult to specifically define because it has lots of ways of being handled, or I guess really not handled. Anger, going to bed, escaping through alcohol, video gaming. But basically what happens is it seems like whatever good mood, if it was present that you were in, evaporates into thin air almost every Sunday, like clockwork. You dread its coming, and you dread your dread. So the Sunday blues are a real thing, and I've had countless patients talk about this same phenomenon over the years. I hear things like, you know, I just get paralyzed by around 3 o'clock on Sunday. I can feel my mood darkening for what seems like no reason except it's Sunday. So today on Self Work, sponsored by BetterHelp, we're going to talk about these Sunday scaries, how the pandemic has changed them, what I decided should be called the seven-day steady scaries, and as always, what you can do about it. I'll offer several articles that can give you ideas of what to do, and and then, of course, I'm going to add in my two bits per usual. The SpeakPipe listener recording today is from a woman who's scared to transition from the job she's had for years as a clinical supervisor, in therapy actually, into private practice, and is asking me for any help I might give. So what would you say? So sit back and relax, and let's talk about the Sunday Scaries. I didn't need to read any articles or learn statistics, although they are out there, about how many of us spend Sunday night, that traditional evening before the work or school week begins again in the Western world, to know that the Sunday blues are a real thing. I've had countless patients talk about this over the years. Vice Magazine had a terrific article about the origins of how the terminology for this state of being evolved. First, in 1946, the psychiatrist Viktor Frankl put the same feeling in more clinical terms. He called it Sunday neurosis, or depression which afflicts people who become aware of the lack of content in their lives when the rush of the busy week is over and the void within themselves becomes manifest. Now, what did he mean by that? This is the same psychiatrist who wrote Man's Search for Meaning, which is actually one of my favorite books, about his experience as a Holocaust survivor in World War II. He was stating, I think, that he believed work and domestic busyness kept many of us from realizing how empty of meaning our lives were, and that it's not until we fill them back up again with busyness that we can avoid or deny this lack of fulfillment or deeper meaning. 
Sunday neurosis didn't really catch on, probably because it was a bit too rooted in existentialism or the study of what gives meaning to life. At a time when people were crawling out of the hardships of World War II and before that, the Great Depression. I actually agree with him, but more about that in a few minutes. The term Sunday Scaries was first mentioned in 2009, but its context then was that you'd been boozing it up all weekend, and the Sunday Scaries happened when you finally were getting toward the end of that and had to go through an incredible hangover. The meaning of that term has actually been maintained. There's even a Sunday Scaries podcast, most of which seems to be devoted to getting over over (laughs) over-drinking. Then it moved into Sunday Blues. But the term Sunday Scary seems to have stuck, mainly because of its maybe misplaced effort in my book to make it humorous. I don't know. I like to laugh at stuff, too, though, I must say. As well as its hashtag ability for social media. Just take a look at Twitter or Instagram. Hashtag Sunday Scaries is all over the place. But now with mental health finally getting at least some of the attention it deserves, the more serious side of Sunday Scaries needs to be focused on. And I've included several examples in your show notes of really good articles talking about ideas of what you can do about it. When you read these articles about what's supposed to fix the more traditional version of Sunday Scaries, they range from organizational advice, for example, like getting your desk ready on Friday from Monday's schedule or what is basically good preparation and thinking ahead, to doing something on Sunday that's really meaningful, going to church, participating in a weekly touch football game, or taking the kids to a park or over to visit family. And the third is changing up your schedule, doing chores often saved for Sunday, and get them out of the way on Saturday. Then maybe Sunday could become a day for revitalization. Then there are more conceptual ideas about how you're experiencing the workplace itself, I can't count the times that someone has said to me that they're depressed and they don't know why. Then they start talking about the pressure at their job or a supervisor who's on their case constantly or how they haven't been promoted or even had a job review in years. So there's a sense of being lost, forgotten, or even trapped. And we haven't even touched on the subject of actual covert abuse that could be a part of anticipating the next today. Those microaggressions that are out there for many people. We're going to talk next about how the pandemic has changed Sunday Scaries after we hear from BetterHelp, a much appreciated sponsor of Self Work. BetterHelp has now been a sponsor of Self Work for a few months, and I've been hearing how pleased you are with their services. I couldn't be more excited about that, as by now you know I'm a huge believer myself in the power of therapy. What is BetterHelp? It's an online therapy service that has earned the number one ranking for the quality of their service to their consumers. When you contact them, you are offered several different licensed professional therapists to choose from, all that have been vetted by BetterHelp. You can have sessions via video, text, or phone. And I found, because of course I checked it out before recommending it to you, that each therapist was very available, literally a text away and made some of the same therapeutic suggestions to me that I'd offer myself as a therapist. Here's an excerpt from a listener who wrote in, I'm a 23-year-old living in Brazil. I'm only writing this message in order to express my gratitude towards you and your podcast. Having anxiety disorder, I always felt like I needed therapy, but I was too anxious to start it. With self-work, not only I've learned some valuable insights about dealing with my condition, but also the basics of how therapy sessions work, which allowed me to finally get some courage to start it. With the coronavirus pandemic, I'd also been concerned about attending personal sessions, but then I learned about better help in your podcast, and it sounded just perfect for what I needed. I've been getting online counseling from better help for six weeks now, and I feel like it's been helping me a lot. That's just so wonderful to hear. And now, BetterHelp has a special offer for you. 10% off the first month of sessions if you use this link. Trybetterhelp.com slash selfwork. That's trybetterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash selfwork. I'm never more honored than hearing someone sought therapy after listening to selfwork. And if selfwork is helping you, maybe BetterHelp is your next step. So welcome back. You might think the pandemic might have eased this dynamic, the Sunday scaries, but in fact, it has not seemed to do so. 
once again from the article from Vice, and I quote, Last year, so that would have been 2020, the Atlantic published a deep dive on the term Sunday scaries in the context of modern workplace anxiety. The piece came out approximately one month before March 2020, when the pandemic forced millions of people to work from home if they still had a job. Curiously, of all the things to collapse, the term Sunday scaries was not one of them. I continue with the Vice article. Since the outbreak of the novel coronavirus, our collective existential dread has arguably only increased. With loss, insecurity, and death as a near constant, the feeling has become more generalized, equally smeared across the week. As a Mashable Guide correctly stated at the beginning of 2021, the scaries now hit different. So my term for this is that the Sunday scaries had become the seven-day steady scaries during the pandemic, as anxiety and a sense of dread grew harder for many to cope with, including myself. Financial anxiety, relationship anxiety, worry about your kids and their education and their mental health, and what has been communal trauma or a trauma that we've all lived through, some to a greater degree than others, but all of us. As I was treating people at the beginning of the pandemic, I listened to those whose anxiety had always been something for them to manage, and either they sharpened the tools that they'd already learned, but even those folks had to dig down deeper than they might have ever had to, even though they'd been managing anxiety for a long time. But that process didn't work for all. Some became agoraphobic, afraid to live any part of what had been their normal life. Truly, the seven-day steady scaries without the cute or humorous side of the term. There were people, and may still be people, literally afraid to breathe outside of their own four walls and fearful every day. So how is all this affecting how we cope? I'm going to crucify this guy's name, or maybe it's a woman, I'm not sure. Pilati Yetur, a psychotherapist, points out in a really good article, that the pandemic caused a lot of blurring of time. The days and weeks grew more similar as many of us couldn't use the weekends to get away or treat them like a mini vacation. Instead, the week was simply ending and a new one beginning. He says, it was a he, I guess, and I quote, Divorced from their primary function, weekends feel at best like empty rituals. At worst, they've become just another workday. In fact, the Society of Human Resource Management reported in December that close to 70%, that's a bunch, 70% of professionals who began to work remotely in the pandemic are now also working during weekend hours. And because of that sameness and the shifts that teachers and so many of us made, which demanded extra work, creativity, extra planning, extra effort, while at the same time not having the things we normally would look forward to. It's been really tough. And let's not forget, and I'm sure some of you who are listening belong tragically to this group, there are over 600,000 families in the U.S. and many more worldwide whose lives have been directly affected by the unexpected death of someone they love. Those aren't statistics. They're people. And the grief has been acute and is ongoing. Many didn't get the chance to say goodbye or to mourn surrounded by friends and family, and that has been demoralizing. Whatever new normal we're approaching will likely still hold within it more ambiguity than we're accustomed to, more of the unknown. So as always, I like to focus on what you can do about it. But in this instance, it is not only what might happen on Sunday, but how this more steady stream of anxiety is affecting you and will continue to affect all of us to a greater or lesser extent as we live out the next few months or even more. I hear people trying to laugh about it. Well, we're trying to plan, but... So let's talk about five tangible things you can do right now to avoid the Sunday scaries, or it's even more foreboding cousin, the seven-day steady scaries. Here's number one. Get back into a schedule of work and time off. You've got to set boundaries and keep them, or your work or the anxiety about your performance or anxiety in general will seep into everything. I know this problem well as it pertains to work, and my spouse might say, the pot's calling the kettle black here, because certainly I spend a lot of weekend time working. 
and being at home really made it more difficult for me to tell, am I working or is this time off? So I'm going to listen to my own words. When you don't have the structure of the work environment, at first that might seem like incredible freedom, but over time, if you don't set really good boundaries, that freedom can turn into a mess and time can go and come. If your anxiety isn't abating or you are fueling it daily by reading the worst reports that are coloring your viewpoint, then realize you also have to stop doing that. It's just not good self-care. I know that authors that I have worked with have said, you know, they have to set a work schedule. They write from 9 to 12, then they take a lunch break, and then they write from 1 to 4 or 5 every day. They have learned that they have to set those boundaries for themselves. It's a really good example of what all of us need to do. Here's number two. Realize if your actual depression or anxiety is worsening to the point that you need a different mode of treatment or you need treatment for the first time. But if you've had treatment in the pandemic or the seven steady scaries, if that is worsening your depression or anxiety, there are all kinds of new treatments. There's TMS or transcranial magnetic stimulation. There's neurofeedback, EMDR, ketamine infusions. It's a really exciting time for mental health. But you first have to realize that the pandemic and its consequences have exacerbated your condition. I had someone I'd seen in the past come to me during the last year virtually, of course, But she didn't see her severe agoraphobia as a problem. She'd always had problems with a germ phobia, and it had grown monstrous as far as its effect on her during the pandemic. Sadly, I couldn't sway her that another belief might be considered. Her family was very worried about her, but she couldn't and wouldn't agree with them. This happens, of course, without a pandemic. Many families have relatives whose addictions or mental illness is creating chaos, but they will not or cannot see it. And it's very hard to know what to do in those instances. But if you have the self-awareness to realize, wait a minute, my depression is getting worse, my anxiety is getting worse, know that there are new treatments, make an appointment with your provider, with your therapist, with a new therapist, with a psychiatrist, and figure out what that could be. Believe me, it's worth it. Number three, ambiguity, the not knowing or having control, is causing lots of emotional paralysis. So what can you do about ambiguity? You have to plan for tomorrow and live for today. What that means is is you've got to plan. We all need things to look forward to, but make sure you're taking into account the realities of today. So you plan, but with flexibility. When my husband and I went through over three years of infertility treatment, I decided that the only way I could keep on handling the disappointment and even hatred of my own body was to begin emotionally investing in what would be my plan B or even plan C and find positive things about that. It was a really good exercise in grieving for what might never be, while at the same time finding hope for the future. So it's an example of making decisions about today and living out those decisions, realizing that you might not have much control over the outcome. You can hope, certainly. And actually, this technique worked so well for me, this emotional investment in a life without children, that when I was lucky enough to maintain a pregnancy and have our son, I actually had to do a little work to let go of that child-free life I'd envisioned. Now, it would have always been plan B, and I'm so grateful for having a son. I don't really know what that living would have been like. There are many of you who are living that life, but it felt real enough to me to have to grieve. So again, you plan, but you insert flexibility into that plan. You can both hope and be realistic all at the same time. Number four, look for what you can do about a job that's unsatisfying. Brainstorm with friends. Look for what you actually have control over. Is that your attitude? Is that your organizational ability? Is that power you're giving someone to bully you? And how can you take that power back? Talk to your partner about making potential changes. If you hate what you do for a living, if there's a little to no way you get anything out of it, then maybe a change is possible. I remember well a couple who told me they were downwardly mobile as their intense commitment to their business had been part of a family dynamic where they'd learned their children were actually being emotionally abused by the family member who was their caregiver. 
They figured out another way. They downsized their lives. It's not that all of us will love what we do for a salary, but if it's truly emotionally costing you, then that can be a topic for discussion. At least put it on the table. And here's number five, the last one. Focus on what your time off expectations are and how you can help one another meet those expectations. So at the end of the weekend, you actually accomplish something or experience something that really meant something to you. This is an exercise I often have couples do. I ask them that on Friday night or Saturday morning, that they talk for five minutes about what each of them would like to accomplish during the weekend. And they're supposed to ask their partner to help them with that one thing and one thing only. You ask them for their help in accomplishing or experiencing whatever it is you want to accomplish or experience. Maybe it's a nap. Maybe it's getting a chore done. Maybe it's going fishing or shopping. Certainly, if you have kids, you get to do what you want to do with the cooperation of the other one, at least in a healthy relationship. What you're doing is giving your partner a heads up and asking for their help. And then you get the same gift in return. Maybe those Sunday blues will turn into Sunday gratitude towards your partner and a sense of getting what you wanted, what you wanted to experience from the weekend so those blues aren't so severe. All of these ideas have the potential of giving you more meaning in your life, a better relationship, work that is satisfying, looking for what you actually have control over and developing emotional skills to handle what you don't, honoring your need for rest and play, and last to realize when you might need to listen more closely to those who love you, see yourself as objectively as possible, so that you can live the life given to you most fully. Good luck to you. Our listener email today is from a woman who's a therapist herself and wants to know if I have any tips for moving into private practice from a much more settled, insured, and safe job, but one she's burned out on. Good morning, Dr. Rutherford. I stumbled on your site, and I love what you have to say around how you're reaching out to people. I, too, am a therapist who's been practicing for about 25 years as well, and I'm trying to make that bridge between leaving my job, where I am a manager for child and youth mental health in Canada, looking after three offices and 12 uh, clinicians. I've been a clinical supervisor for 20 years. I'm trying to break away from my job and move into private practice, and but I'm finding that I'm just so exhausted and burnt out and afraid of losing my salary because I am a single woman with a mortgage, I'm divorced, and I have this fear of not having that stability. And so it's creating a huge amount of stress for me. But um, I'm trying as best as I can. And if you have any suggestions, I would certainly appreciate it. Thanks, Lynn. Bye. Life is so synergistic sometimes, or maybe we only notice it sometimes, and it's quite synergistic all the time. I was just asked this week to formulate some responses to the question, what is burnout and what are some remedies? It's just amazing that I got this from Lynn. There are three dimensions or symptoms of burnout, which has actually now been officially recognized as an occupational disorder. Now, not a medical disorder, but an occupational disorder. It's recognized by the World Health Organization. And here they are. The three key dimensions of burnout are an overwhelming exhaustion, feelings of cynicism and detachment from the job, and a sense of ineffectiveness and lack of accomplishment. Let me read those again. Overwhelming exhaustion, feelings of cynicism and detachment from the job, and a sense of ineffectiveness and lack of accomplishment. So it seems that Lynn is caught between this horrible state of burnout and the understandable fear of leaving the economic stability her job holds and going out on her own. But burnout doesn't go away. You can't wish it away. It seems that once it happens at its most severe, it's there to stay. And the only fix is true change. It reminds me of working with couples. I'd rather they come in yelling and screaming at one another than apathetically telling me they just don't care anymore they're burned out. So this is what I'd recommend. First, how fast is your burnout getting worse? And write what the cost, both emotional, physical, and practical, is it causing? 
We know from research that exhaustion and burnout are actually separate things, but that burnout can lead to depression and even suicidal thinking. So it's to be taken seriously. Think about some pragmatic ideas. Is there one aspect of your job that you could delegate to someone else? Talk to whoever your superior is and give that part of your job to them, to someone else. Maybe taking a small but manageable cut in salary. Then use that time to put out your shingle, so to speak. Begin advertising with Facebook or a local website or paper that you're opening hours on the weekend or one night a week. Hopefully, the jolt and the excitement you get from starting something new may balance out the extra temporary work. But you're basically testing out how long it would take to build your own practice. Or try an even more intermediate step. Talk to a group practice and ask if you could join and offer Saturday sessions. What I'm trying to paint here is a scenario where there's not an either or, but it's an and. Looking into the cost of insurance on your own is another step. I myself had three jobs when I began my practice, so that was the fourth. (laughs) My practice was the fourth. I worked at the community health center, I led an outpatient group at a local psychiatric hospital, and I worked in a couple of schools. I was very busy, but my practice began also very slowly, as I was completely new to the area. You're well known, however, Lynn, and that shouldn't be a problem for you. Basically, I think you need to honor your fear and your burnout all at the same time. That's that and I was talking about. It's not easy to do. A vacation might fix exhaustion, but it doesn't fix burnout. I also wonder if you know what your strengths are or if you're a bit afraid because you've been out of providing therapy yourself for a while. If that's so, volunteer a couple of hours a week to a domestic violence shelter or a free health clinic. Get back in the swing and your confidence will come back. Another just practical idea is you can decide to get a certification that would be highly useful and very sought after in your area, such as earning a CSAT or learning EMDR. Those trainings almost ensure a good practice here in the U.S., if especially you live in a metropolitan area. Read everything you can as well about making midlife transitions and find out how others face their fears. But you took a great step. You let yourself ask me this question. And I certainly hope my answer has been helpful. I want to thank all of you for being here. I've gotten several ratings and reviews on Amazon for my book, Perfectly Hidden Depression, and I want to thank you for that. The fact that you've taken five minutes to make that rating or review really means a lot to me. And certainly since the book has been out a year and a half now, I need that boost from new ratings and reviews. So thank you so much. And of course, for all of you who have done the same, wherever you listen to self-work, that's also something I'm very grateful for. My website's drmargaretrutherford.com, and you can subscribe there and get a weekly newsletter with my blog post and podcast, as well as just some information about what's going on with me or what I have to offer. Just one email, I promise. You can email me a question or a comment at AskDrMargaret at DrMargaretRutherford.com. You can join my Facebook closed group at Facebook.com slash groups slash self Thank you so much for being here, all of you. I hope that the Sunday scaries haven't turned into seven-day steady scaries for you, but if they have, I certainly hope these suggestions will be helpful. Take very good care. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been self